Every culture on the planet has their own compendium of terrifying monsters that would rip you to pieces as soon as look at you. The Philippines is home to the blood-sucking witch known as the Mananangal. Certain Native American tribes believe in the cannibalistic Wendigo. The werewolf was prominent in a number of European countries to the point where people were literally tried and executed because of accusations of werewolfism. But as scary as these beasts are, some of the most feared creatures in folklore, ironically, don't actually cause us any harm at least not directly. While the Mononongle, Wendigo, and Werewolf all deliver death on a silver platter, well, maybe not a silver platter in the Werewolf's case, there are other folkloric figures whose sole existence is to warn us when death is approaching. These are known as Harbingers of Death, and without a doubt, the two most famous Harbingers in the Western world come from Celtic folklore the Banshee and the Doolahan. We've talked about them both in the past, the Banshee in 2021 and the Doolahan all the way back in 2018 with my buddy Isaac Carlson. And while those have certainly held up, we spent the majority of the Headless Horseman episode talking about the Legend of Sleepy Hollow story and only left a few minutes at the end for a dissection of the Doolahan. And such a legendary figure deserves a proper analysis, wouldn't you agree? I mean, the Celtic people have been telling stories about the Headless Horseman for at least 200 years so I think I can get away with once every five. Besides, last time I didn't even get to share some of the best stories. Though I should warn you before I share them today that while some are creepy as hell, others are straight up hilarious. So get ready to laugh and cry. Yeah! <laughs> first things first, what is a Doolahan and what does it do? So Doolahan is the term that the Celtic peoples gave to their headless rider of legend. The Celtic countries being Ireland, Scotland, Cornwall, Wales, the Isle of Man, and Brittany. The term Doolahan is used to describe a dark and gloomy person, which is a pretty fitting way of describing someone whose head has been cut off. I know I'd be pretty gloomy if that happened. The rider himself has been given a variety of physical descriptions and backstories over the past few centuries. Some say he dresses entirely in black and rides a black horse that also has its head missing. Other folks upgrade his single horse to six and give him a stagecoach that's adorned with the heads of the recently deceased. One quality that stays consistent across all tales is that the Doolahan only appears at night. Now this might be because humans have poor vision at night and are more likely to trick themselves into thinking they saw something in the moonlight off in the distance out of the corner of their eye, or it could be because the Doolahan likes to keep a low profile. Just like banshees and leprechauns, the Doolahan is what's known in Celtic folklore as a solitary fairy. It prefers to avoid human contact, which is good because a human seeing a Doolahan means that their death is on the horizon. The horseman himself is very rarely the cause of said death because that isn't his jam. He's more likely to throw a bucket of blood in your face or use his whip made from human spine to blind you. Still pretty rude, but hey, you're gonna die soon anyway, right? Now, a common point of confusion with the Doolahan is whether or not he's actually lost his head. Everyone can agree that his head has been cut off. That's kind of his whole thing. But depending on the story, he might hold it under his arm while he rides or have it sitting comfortably on the pommel of his saddle. A lot of the time, his head even glows so he can use it as a lantern when the moon's light isn't bright enough. Other times, they make no mention of his head at all, just that it's nowhere to be seen, leaving us to assume his missing head is the result of a curse, that it was destroyed in the process of being removed, like in the case of Washington Irving's horseman, who was apparently a soldier that had his head blown off by a cannonball, or he simply misplaced it and he can't connect to his air tag for some reason. Hate it when that happens. The horseman being headless does raise an interesting question, though. Why is he headless? I don't mean the story behind how he lost his head, we just established that he has multiple backstories. What I want to know is why when people from centuries ago warned each other about the Doolahan, they described him, and even his horse, with their heads missing. There's got to be some symbolism behind that, right? Well, you could argue that if the Doolahan really exists, then that simply must be what they saw. But if you don't buy into that, you might appreciate learning that the ancient Celts had a special appreciation for human heads and believed they were the vessel for the soul. In other words, calling the horseman headless also meant he was soulless, which explains why he was cursed to remain here on the mortal plane. And who better to warn you of your impending death than a man whom death was denied to? It honestly kind of reminds me of Red Skull's punishment in the MCU. His arrogance caused him to think he could control the stone's power, and so he was forced to guard the soul stone for eternity, advising the people who sought it instead of being able to claim it for himself. Definitely not a one-to-one -one comparison, but 
similar vibes, right? Now, as I said before, stories about the Dullahan have been passed around the Celtic countries for centuries, but the stories that are the most well-known all come from the same collection. And we'll be diving into those tales after a word from this week's sponsor, Squarespace. For the two-ish people who don't know about Squarespace, they are the industry leaders in DIY website creation. There is a massive library of stunning website templates you can choose from to get started, and after you've got the basics set up, you can add galleries of artwork and playlists of music to really make your space unique. You can even sell products on these sites you build with Squarespace. And they give you analytics that show you how much traffic you have, where it's coming from, and what people are doing on your site, which goes a long way when growing your business. Would maybe the craziest feature of all though is that all of this design work I've talked about can be done inside your web browser. There's no fancy software to install, nothing to download or patch, and there never will be. So if you want to join me and the thousands in our community who've benefited from using Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Almost 200 years ago, in 1825, Thomas Crofton Croker published a collection of Celtic folklore titled Fairy Legends and Traditions of the South of Ireland. Many of the stories he included he learned while visiting Southern Ireland during the research process for his previous book, Researches in the South of Ireland. A fitting title, to be sure. Croker's Book of Fairy Tales would be a massive success upon its release, but that success was not without controversy. It turns out that during the book's creation, Croker lost his unfinished manuscript and had to resort to asking other writers for their help in finishing it. The issue with that is that he didn't give those writers any credit in the original publication. Granted, he left his own name off the collection as well, but he very much enjoyed his name being written on the checks he received for the book sales. This got under some of the other writers' skins, particularly Thomas Cately. So in response to the criticisms, Croker removed the stories that the other authors claimed to have contributed in later publications. This brought the compendium down from 50 stories to 40 in total four of which are about our boy, the Dullahan. Let's start with the shortest of the four. It's a poem called The Death Coach, and it starts out by repeating a lot of the physical description I gave last section, but it rhymes, so it's better. Tis midnight, how gloomy and dark. By Jupiter, there's not a star. Tis fearful, tis awful, and hark. What sound is that comes from afar. Still rolling and rumbling, that sound makes nearer and nearer approach. Do I tremble, or is it the ground? Lord save us, what is it? A coach. A coach, but that coach has no head, and the horses are headless as it. Of the driver the same may be said, and the passengers inside who sit. See the wheels, how they fly o'er the stones, and whirl as the whip, it goes crack. Their spokes are of dead men's thigh bones, and the pole is the spine of the back. The hammer cloth, shabby display, is a pall rather mildewed by damps, and to light this strange coach on its way, two hollow skulls hang up for lamps. The poem goes on to describe the coach as driving quite chaotically. They blow their way through town and blaze up steep hills just as fast as they go down them because they're already dead and don't have to worry about their safety. The poem ends with the carriage pulling into a cemetery just outside a churchyard and the coachman and his passengers set up camp for the night. Then, in the final lines, they reveal their mission. Since none of them have heads of their own, they're going to the old head of Kinsale, a spot in Ireland which I can only describe as a little strip of land that projects out into the sea. We have no idea why they wanted to go there. It's probably just because of the pun but maybe it was to try their 18-hole golf course. You never know. The next story I want to share is called Hanlon's Mill. Not a whole lot happens in it, but Croker is able to create a pretty creepy atmosphere that our protagonist has to get through. It kind of reminds me of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Basically, you've got this guy named Michael Noon, called Mick, who's forced to take the long, lonely walk through the forest to get to his shoemaker. It was early evening when he started his journey. The sun had just set, and on the way, he could have sworn he heard horses galloping, hounds howling, and men shouting behind him, almost as if they were chasing him. But the noises came and went without him seeing a soul, and so he continued on his way and picked up his new kicks. While at the shoemakers, Mick ran into his neighbor, Darby. Darby was waiting for some family to arrive in town and asked Mick if he could take his carriage home with him. 
and naturally Mick agreed because there was no way he was trying to walk through the forest alone at night. This proved to be a wise decision because that night Mick saw something in the forest and it wasn't just a quick glance either. While he was sitting in the stagecoach, gazing out the window and appreciating the moonlight and stars, a shadow suddenly fell over him as if a great big cloud had invaded the sky. Mick popped his head out the window to see what the deal was and what he saw nearly made him shit his pants. Okay, the text doesn't actually say anything about pants shitting, but if I were in his shoes, his brand new shoes, there would definitely be some leakage. Know what I'm saying? The reason being that when Mick looked out the window, he saw the death coach, a high black coach drawn by six black horses, driven by a coachman dressed in all black and missing his head. The death coach silently sped by him like a demon's whisper, not making a sound the entire time it was in sight. But the next morning, Mick learned where it was traveling to because he ran into a huntsman who frantically reported that his master, Mr. Rickson, had died. Who's Mr. Rickson? We have no idea, which makes that reveal a lot less impactful, but it's still a better ending than How I Met Your Mother's. And that, kids, is How I Met the Doolahan. Now, these last two stories are tied for my favorite. Both of them get pretty creepy, but also have some humor sprinkled in. For the sake of time, I'm gonna keep them short though. The first tale is called The Good Woman and has a pretty unconventional take on the Doolahan. It stars a man named Larry who was obsessed with a pair of leather pants he owned and never took them off. This is not an important detail, but at the same time, it's the most important detail. So one day, Larry buys a new horse, and on his way back home, he notices a pretty young thing trying to catch up to him. He offers her a ride, she accepts, and eventually they come to a small stream. Larry hops off the horse to guide it across the water, and at that same time, the mysterious hitchhiker also gets off the horse and runs deep into the forest. This is where Larry reveals himself to be a big fat creep, though I'm sure some of you already figured that out considering he wears leather pants. He chases after the girl demanding payment in the form of a kiss from her pretty lips. I know, disgusting, but she ignores him and he chases her into a churchyard. After catching up to the maiden, Larry grabs hold of her and tries to give her a smooch, only to realize that her head is missing. The fact that he just held the Doolahan in his hands nearly causes him to faint, but when he recovers, he's invited to drink some ale by a wheel of decapitated heads that was sitting in the corner. This was no doubt the weirdest day in Larry's life, but it was about to get weirder because when he tilted his head back to drain his drink, he felt cold steel rip through his neck and his head was sent flying through the air. The narrator takes this opportunity to preach some wisdom and warns the reader that Larry isn't the first man to lose his head from the temptation to see the bottom of a drinking glass. You don't have to worry about him though, at least not about him being decapitated, because somehow he woke up the next morning with his head still attached. But this didn't mean he was safe, not by a long shot. After all, he had to explain to his irate wife where he was and who led him there. As you can imagine, his wife, Nancy, is furious at her husband and she goes on a tangent about how he's such a villain. Then the narrator gives us the story's second lesson. The hitchhiker Larry picked up may have been missing her head, but that meant she couldn't speak. And any woman who can't talk is, by default, a good one. Hey, those were Croker's words, not mine. I only agree with him a little bit. Happy Women's History Month, by the way. Now I gotta be honest with yous, our final story of the day was actually featured in my episode on the messed up origins of Sleepy Hollow. So this is kind of a repeat. The funny thing about it though, is that I didn't actually tell the story in that video. Isaac did, so this is technically my first time sharing it with you all. The tale in question is called The Headless Horseman. It features a character named Charlie, who seems like a nice guy, and you guessed it, a headless horseman. Only this horseman is also somewhat untraditional. On a particularly rainy night, Charlie and his horse are making their way across the countryside when out of the corner of his eye, he sees a white horse's head floating over the road. As he looked over, he saw the horse's body walking behind the floating head and the rider on it, who was dressed in all black, had his own head tucked under his arm. Charlie was terrified to say the least, but he tried to be polite to the Doolahan who wasn't making much conversation. Only when he compliments the horseman's ride, he responds, you may say that with your own ugly mouth. Yeah, this coming from a literal decapitated head that smells like death and armpit sweat. 
I mean, check out this description of it. It looked like a large cream cheese hung round with black puddings. No speck of color enlivened the ashy paleness of the depressed features. The skin lay stretched over the unearthly surface, almost like the parchment head of a drum. Two fiery eyes of prodigious circumference with a strange and irregular motion flashed like meteors upon Charlie, and a huge mouth reached from either extremity of two ears, which peeped forth from under a profusion of matted locks of lusterless blackness. This head, which the figure had evidently hitherto concealed from Charlie's eyes, now burst upon his view in all its hideousness. Now it's undeniable the headless horseman was being a little cunty at first, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say, but his whole attitude changed when Charlie asked him if he'd ever raced across the countryside. In response, the Doolahan asked Charlie to race him. At first, Charlie was intimidated, and who can blame him? But ultimately, he followed the golden rule. When a decapitated head gives you a challenge, you accept. Sadly, Charlie doesn't win the race, but he is still rewarded. The Doolahan compliments his courage and says that no one had been willing to race him since he and his horse broke their necks at the bottom of Kilcoomer Hill a hundred years before. Then he promises that if Charlie keeps riding and continues to be the adventurous man he proved himself to be that night, then the headless horseman will never leave his side or his horses. Now, I'm not sure if you guys would want the ghost of a decapitated huntsman to follow you around all day, but Charlie seemed to think it was a pretty sweet deal. And I would argue he ended up being right because the very next day he entered a horse race, the headless horseman helped him win, and he pocketed a cool hundred bucks. So I guess the moral of this story is don't judge a book by its cover. Be kind and supportive to everyone you meet, no matter how ugly, because they could make you rich someday. At least that's the moral I walked away with. But what about you? Do you think the Doolahan can teach us any other important life lessons? And which story that we covered today was your favorite? Let me know in a comment down below. Then make sure you sacrifice those like and subscribe buttons to get new mythology and folklore content sent to your sub box every single weekday. And follow the Messed Up Origins podcast on your favorite podcast platform to get these same episodes sent to your device every Friday morning. I'll see you all next week when we dive into the Messed Up Origins of bubble wrap. My name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first.